Hello everyone, this is the CAR Battery Enclosure Webinar. Uh, we have people joining in, so we would wait a couple of minutes before starting. Thank you. All right, uh, sir, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Shashank Modi. I'm a research engineer at the Center for Automotive Research. We are here for the battery enclosure design webinar series. Uh, we have been doing a series of webinars on battery enclosure design. This is our second. Before going into webinar, I quickly uh, want to inform you that we have uh, we are partnered with Altair for the Altair Enlightened Award. We have been doing it for the last few years. Uh, this is the automotive industry's only award dedicated to lightweighting and sustainability. The entries are now open and uh, you can visit the link that you see on the website. And there are several categories that you can submit uh, for for lightweighting sustainability uh, and we will give this award out at the management briefing seminars in august so as i said uh this is the second the series of battery enclosure webinars today we have a, a, a great speaker from hexion to talk about polymer composite battery enclosure design uh, last thursday we saw uh, uh, discuss, uh, saw and discussed about aluminum battery enclosure designs. So today is polymer composites. And to talk about that, we have Dr. Ian Swintek, who is a senior application development engineer at Hexion with us today. Hi, Ian. Uh, Dr. Ian Swintek is a senior application, uh, application development engineer at Hexion, is specializing in epoxy and uh, phenolic based technologies for high volume automotive application. He has nearly a decade of experience in composite processing and including sheet molding compound, liquid compression molding and high pressure resin transfer molding. He holds a doctoral degree in mechanical and materials engineering from the University of Western Ontario and is a registered professional engineer in Ontario. Additionally, Dr. Swentek is currently serving as the chair of the Society of Plastics Engineers Composite Division, and recently as a Regional Director for the Society of Advancements of Material and Process Engineering Canada. With that, I would like to hand it over to Ian, but just want to remind you that uh, we want to keep this webinar interactive. There's a Q&A box, which you can use to submit your questions. So keep them coming. I will ask them uh, on the relevant slides, or uh, I will ask them after Ian has done with the presentation. So we will have enough time for Q&A, but please keep your questions coming. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, Shashank. Also for Sarah, for your technical support as I share my screen here. 
I will try to pause at the end of every slide just so that if there are questions, Shashank has a chance to to be able to pass those along to me as I can't see the chat window while I'm presenting. It's just not quite, uh, not, not easy for the, the setup that I'm working from. But thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Today I'll be taking a high level view of polymer based material solutions or EV applications with specific emphasis on battery enclosures. While we will talk about some of the Hexion specific offerings, a lot of the information will relate to sort of a multi-material solution and with again with that emphasis on polymer based um, materials so rather than a uh, sort of a, a table of content i really would like you to walk away with maybe one or two uh, key lessons learned and if you were to walk away with one thing it would be sort of understanding the requirements of battery enclosures i've listed sort of a, some high level um, key key points I'd like to make today just about the nature of these battery enclosures, the need for fire resistance, um, why they should be lightweight, and how they can be designed in a cost-effective way. So we'll come back to that at the very end. But first, uh, again, sort of the requisite boilerplate on who Hexion is. If you haven't heard of us, sometimes we think of ourselves as, as one of the world's largest um, resin companies you've never heard of, but we are a, a specialty resin company that serves a variety of markets and we've existed for quite some time. And in the last decade or so, we've begun to uh, formulate products for end use markets. And I'll talk about a, a little bit of those, but our, our key strengths are on thermoset resin materials. So epoxy and phenolic resins. A quick word about our history. Again, it, sometimes we're, we're a large company that people haven't heard of because we have gone through a number of, of acquisitions and iterations. But by and large, our heritage began with Borden Chemical sort of at the dawn of, of commercial polymers. And this became a, a larger division through Shell Chemical, which incorporated a number of, um, of subsidiaries, things like silicones, uh, epoxy materials, some urethanes for a time, uh, and, and taking on trade names such as Momentum and, and most recently Hexion. We continue to be a very large global company, uh, headquartered out of Columbus, Ohio but we have presence all around the world. You can see on screen a few of those locations. Um, some of the key development sites in the United States would be Deer Park, Texas and, and Lakeland, Florida, where we do a lot of um, raw resin production and blending. We also have facilities around the world for uh, research and development activities where we can do not just resin production, but actual end use composite manufacturing and development to really get a handle on what is required in industry for these material systems, for the process and handling, uh, and to support our customers in new applications development. You can see a few of the industries where we um, have a strong presence and we do maintain a, a very uh, strong presence in those industries, um, number one in a, in a few key areas. Our main um, products, again, are epoxy and phenolic resins. We also have a large portfolio of uh, versatic acids and derivatives, which are key coatings elements for um, high temperature corrosion resistant coatings and for marine coatings. A lot of our materials wind their way into everyday products. Um, we have a, a large presence in the wood and pulp paper industry to produce phenolic resins as binders and as adhesives for those industries. Uh, and today we'll be talking about some uh, FR performance, which actually comes from our aerospace division. A lot of the developments there have been longstanding for fire, smoke and toxicity performance in the aerospace industry. And our job over the last few years has been to translate those uh, improvements to automotive efficiencies, preparing for high volume, high build rate programs, uh, specifically around battery enclosures. Uh, and as a last sort of um, high level slide, I wanted to talk about sustainability. This is a, a, key, um, a key metric for us in terms of the materials we prepare and produce, as well as how we conduct our business. Uh, we have a strong sustainability mindset, not only from the raw elements that we consume and making sure that those are sourced sustainably and responsibly. Uh, we also take a, a leadership position when it comes to recycling and uh, waste mitigation uh, strategies for not just our materials, but the products that our materials find their way into. So if you want to reach out, we'd love to chat more about that. And uh, if there are questions, we can sort of come back to that at the very end around some of the materials and how, how individual resin families are sustainably sourced or sustainably produced. 
But the goal today is to really focus on new electric vehicles. To talk about how these vehicles are being developed, what are some of the key boundary conditions, legislative uh, requirements for these vehicles, and where in these vehicles we see a strong need for new materials development and, and new products uh, development. A few of the areas that we have a strong presence in currently uh, are shown on screen and I'll, I'll draw your attention to a few of them. Um, in an electric vehicle, of course, we have uh, the body in white, the structure. Um, by and large, that is to support a very heavy, low center of gravity uh, battery pack. Uh, and so some of the requirements actually are, are very amenable to polymer, reinforced polymer composites in, those, in that body in white. We'll be talking very specifically about battery enclosures today. And I would also point, your, point out things like electric motors. And while you might think electric motors are a primarily metallic solution, um, there's a lot of areas, again, for polymers within those motors. I speak uh, uh, specifically about um, the windings around those motors and uh, the need for encapsulation to prevent those windings from moving and to have a high temperature, you know, low, um, uh, low viscosity resin that can wet out those windings and prevent them from, uh, from moving around during high speed operation. Uh, oftentimes those electric motors operate at high temperature around 150 Celsius, uh, very similar to the temperature profile of a combustion engine and need to have a polymer uh, resin that will fixate those windings and not to be, you know, be very crack tolerant. Um, having the ability to, uh, to conduct, um, you know, greater amounts of current. So it needs to be insulating, needs to have uh, some, some key properties there. We have a number of solutions that are already winding their way. Um, pun intended, into these uh, electric motors. And uh, again, not the focus of today, but certainly something that we can speak uh, at, at great length about. So the focus of today, electric vehicle battery enclosures. And I'll be talking a lot about the current trends, some of the requirements, and giving you some specific examples of, uh, of applications development in this area. Uh, first, a, a thought on motivation. And we like to start here because um, no one wants their vehicle to ignite or to burn. Uh, certainly no one wants to think of their vehicle as being dangerous. But when it comes to lithium polymer and lithium ion batteries, um, they are somewhat unstable. You can't overcharge or undercharge them. They are susceptible to thermal runaway from the battery pack themselves or from external events, such as a, a short circuit, um, uh, heating from, the, from outside environments, such as a collision with a battery or a, a gasoline uh, propelled vehicle. And what can happen is if, if the lithium polymer or lithium ion batteries do uh, experience a high temperature condition, um, they're, they're self burning, self oxygenating. You, you can't put out the fires with, um, with traditional materials. And the goal of passenger safety and protection is really around buying enough time for occupants to safely leave the vehicle. So there's two key requirements when it comes to uh, the enclosure then. And this would uh, be, in our opinion, the, the most difficult and most challenging requirement of battery enclosures to be able to um, accomplish and design around. And this would be sort of from the external events, so a so-called bonfire type event where gasoline might pool underneath uh, a battery enclosure. And that's already regulated in both China and in Europe, um, the need to withstand the bonfire test. So that's a two minute burn event uh, from a gasoline based uh, fuel source. Uh, the newer and more restrictive uh, legislative requirement is what's called the internal or thermal runaway event. And this was approved just last year in China, um, which went live in January of this year, which means that all new vehicles must pass this test in China now for their uh, vehicle designs and must be phasing them in this year. And that's what happens when a, a battery pack or cell experiences a, a runaway condition, either from um, an electrical ignition source or some over uh, some puncture source or perhaps from a thermal event, if it was uh, heating up too much. And if, if that happens um, because of how closely packed the cells are, and even if one cell goes off, those pose a very high internal risk. Um, to give you a sense of things, within the first few seconds of, of a thermal runaway, a lithium polymer battery can heat up to 2200 Celsius with average internal temperatures uh, in these battery enclosures around 1400 Celsius. So enough to almost melt glass in terms of their, uh, of their temperature exposure, 
There's an ablative element from, you know, exploding lithium polymer salts that can occur depending upon the prismatic or, or pouch designs. Um, and so there's, there's a large number of things that we need to mitigate. We need to mitigate both the heat, we need to mitigate the, the mechanical loading that can occur on these battery packs, and we need to uh, mitigate some of the, um, you know, some of the potential for, for smoke and toxicity there. Uh, and that's primarily the job of the enclosure to uh, accomplish. A very simplified view then of a battery enclosure is a cover and tray. The cover has the, the, a semi-structural job. Often it doesn't bear as much load as the tray. It primarily protects the passenger compartment and therefore has a, a very high uh, fire requirement, a fire protection requirement. It also offers the, um, the primary sealing surface for the, the battery uh, enclosure and therefore needs to have um, uh, prevention from ingress of moisture from dust and from debris. The battery tray now needs to bear the load of the battery packs themselves, and these can get quite heavy. Uh, the larger the vehicle, footprint vehicle and the more energy dense that you wish to um, uh, pack into, the, into these battery enclosures, the more these can weigh, uh, up to about 400 kilograms. Um, so varying designs, depending upon whether it's a full battery electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid vehicle, you'll have battery uh, packs weighing anywhere between 80 and, and 400 kilograms, just sort of to give you a range of, of typical weights. Uh, and oftentimes this can not just include the batteries, but they also include all of the heat cool um, circuitry and uh, ducting requirements for maintaining temperatures inside the battery enclosure. It includes all of the electronic controls uh, and, a self, and usually it's self-contained to be able to hold all the battery charge and discharge um, electronics. And so the tray needs to act both as a, a material, um, you know, a, a crash protector for the batteries. Uh, dealing with side impact and, and cross impact loads, as well as jack loads from underneath the vehicle. It needs to bear the weight of the batteries themselves, which can be quite heavy. And as this gets monolithically large, um, the requirements to maintain both mechanical and then subsequently mechanical and thermal loading uh, during protection events uh, means that the tray tends to be the more restrictive of the two elements, the harder to design for, the one that has uh, more requirements on it, both mechanically and, and thermally. To give you a sort of a high level view then of the state of the legislation, uh, China is a full FST required. So FST stands for fire, smoke and toxicity, meaning that there are strong regulations that dictate um, the requirements for the enclosure in all three of those areas. And so that is now live. That means that uh, new vehicles that come onto the market and are designed today must meet these strict requirements. So in China today, we see a, a very strong pull condition for battery enclosures, and for cost-effective material solutions there. In Europe, they have adopted some of those requirements already, namely the bonfire testing. They have strict CO2 emissions targets that tend to push towards electric vehicles. Uh, and in general, they lag about one to two years behind the Chinese type uh, requirements. And so that we would say is strongly moving in the direction of full FST uh, requirements on, on the enclosure, cover and tray. Um, but as of today, you could still design components for a battery electric vehicle that don't need to meet um, the full gambit then of these uh, of these uh, fire um, uh, fire retardant uh, um, you know legislative requirements. In the U.S., I would say there are much fewer legislation uh, on the table today. There is some talk of this. By and large, the companies, the the major OEMs that are moving in this direction are moving that way because they have a global footprint. So if they're designing a vehicle for China or for Europe, they need to meet those stricter requirements in those other regions and thereby also meet them for the North American region um, just by proxy. We would start to see a lot of pull uh, from the North American OEMs, but more from a, an investigative type um, uh, stance where they're sort of looking at what the next gen requirements are rather than it being uh, we need to deploy the solution today uh, as is the case for China. And so we're, we're constantly staying on top of this and looking at these because we not only want to uh, provide a, a family of solutions for the individual regional requirements, but we also want to better understand what type of 
uh, implications these requirements have on, on everything from the materials design uh, through the sustainability aspect, how you recycle these materials and how you, um, how you actually produce them in the first place. So Ian, uh, I have a quick question here. One is, uh, have you started seeing automakers, uh, you know, whose ma market is North America or Europe adopting uh, some of the Chinese standard because they want to, you know, maintain a global, global platform and anticipate that US or Europe will follow? So that's my first question. And second is, this is on fire, fire safety. Do you, uh, are there any regulations on the crash safety as well? Right. So let me deal with the first one. North American OEMs being required to, we would say that they are investigating the requirements and, and some of them are designing for, for the Chinese requirements today um, or are producing uh, battery enclosures that must meet those requirements today. In terms of, of what happens regionally, um, you know, so there are vehicles on the market that will, you know, a there are vehicles on the market, in, for instance, the North American market that would not meet the, the Chinese standards today, to give you an idea. And so there are, I would say, a number of, of background conversations and, and, again, an increasing pull condition. In the past year, especially, we've seen a very strong increase in, in requests for information around how those Chinese requirements will impact uh, global designs. On the second part of your um, your statement around uh, mechanical requirements, absolutely. And I'll, I'll certainly try to do a better representative job of getting into that. Um, if you had a chance to see the aluminum presentation from last week, a lot of that was already covered with the, the current mechanical loading requirements, but I will have a slide or two on commenting what else needs to be managed as part of these battery enclosures in conjunction with these, these FR uh, requirements. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, just to get really detailed here, just for a moment, because this is interesting and it gives you a sense of the flavor of these uh, these requirements and and what uh, why they're so challenging. Um, so looking at the two Chinese standards, just at a very high level, the first one we would call the um, sort of um, external fire event, sort of the bonfire event, and we have a video showing that off in a minute. This is a, a two-minute test with half of that time being required to be direct flame exposure and half of it can be direct or can be indirect. And there you're really trying to minimize um, uh, the interior temperature rise on the battery. We don't want the batteries to ignite uh, or to experience thermal runaway if the outside temperature is to climb. Uh, so the typical requirement here is that the battery enclosure itself, um, you know, no explosion and no fire, it has to be self-extinguishing. Uh, but it's a, I would say it's not as um, hard a test to pass. The, the general temperature exposure is in between the 700 to 900 Celsius range for a few minutes. So it's not uh, overly cumbersome. And there are lots of materials, uh, solutions to accomplish that. Um, uh, we'll talk about a few of them in a moment. The, the more restrictive and the, and the harder to pass test is the internal uh, test. And this is where you require uh, a minimum of five minutes uh, time from the point of thermal runaway. So when the, when the battery pack detects that it's experiencing either a temperature condition or an electrical condition that would lead to thermal runaway, the enclosure must withstand five minutes of time from that point. Um, and whatever happens at that point, so either it has to withstand, you know, a, a cascade failure of the battery pack, or it has to withstand high temperature uh, conditions, or, or perhaps a, a combination of mechanically ablative conditions. And that is where the, um, the internal temperatures can really climb quite quickly. Uh, so the typical test condition for that is, is, a, is a long duration test uh, looking at 1400 Celsius type um, fire exposure, type thermal exposure, uh, and ensuring that the battery enclosure itself will protect against that. To back to your comment a moment ago, Shawshank, uh, and some of the questions that might have arisen, what are the what are the other key requirements? So we've talked at length about the fire um, uh, resistant requirement. So I won't uh, won't go into more detail there. There are the mechanical package loads. So depending upon the specific vehicle, these are generally categorized as sort of the five loads you see there. So knee loads, impact loads, uh, offset barrier uh, has to be puncture proof uh, and impermeable to water and dust. Um, humorously, uh, the, the difficult ones there, the, the barrier testing can be quite difficult, especially side impact. Um, 
and the uh, impermeable to water and dust uh, is not too challenging until you realize that the most lithium polymer cells, when they start to experience a thermal runaway, so in the fire resistant requirement, they'll also produce a strong pressure requirement. Uh, and so the battery enclosure must also experience um, sometimes several atmospheres of pressure uh, internal to the um, uh, to the pack without again exploding. So there there are a number of strategies both in the material solution and in the um, uh, and in some of the, the off gassing and uh, you know pressure bypass valves that can occur. So we want to prevent you know water coming in, but we have to let things like gas escape just for the the battery pack to breathe uh, a little bit. And those loads are in addition to things like the battery weight loads. And so the, um, the requirements now are getting quite strict. And so what does that mean from a materials uh, standpoint? Uh, it means that we're not able to get away with heavily filled um, polymer composites anymore. We have to start looking at, at non-filled or at uh, even continuous fiber reinforced polymers. Um, metals can be all right at addressing some of these mechanical requirements, but they become quite tricky to address the combined mechanical and, and thermal protection. Uh, and then when you start to look at some of the other performance metrics, we want the material to be corrosion resistant. We want it to be lightweight for assembly and service. Um, the ability for both non-conductive, um, you know, from grounding standpoint and from, um, from a protective standpoint and providing that thermal regulation. So we don't want, for example, the battery pack to be so thermally conductive that, uh, you know, it's experiencing very cold temperatures in the winter. Um, we want the batteries to sort of always stay around room temperature for both their life cycle and for, for safety. So often you'll see that uh, on large battery packs, things like city movers, um, light rail, and, and even some larger vehicles, the need to keep those battery packs sort of regulated around room temperature. Uh, and then combined with a, an EMI requirement on some battery packs. And so that EMI can, you know, range. Not every battery pack requires that, just like not every battery enclosure requires the um, um, uh, the non-conductive requirement, uh, certainly for the outer materials, those are somewhat design dependent. Um, uh, we've had sort of an increasing um, interest there. And this is, I think, some of these, uh, these combined requirements are where polymers really shine because they can be designed and um, manufactured as a, as a hybrid holistic solution. What I mean there is they can address all of these requirements simultaneously without having to think of things like extra coatings, extra blankets, extra assembly steps, extra um, types of production steps. And so that's really the, the main strength of wanting to look at, uh, at a polymer uh, composite material solution. So one, one comment from the audience is one requirement that I missed was around serviceability. Is the requirement today or coming in the future? So of course, you know, cars needs to be serviceable because we expect 11 to 12 years uh, life cycle up to them. Right. So the typical service, um, the service point is for at least for the individual cover, you know, assuming that there's no battery load there, you have that sort of 40 pound requirement um, for one worker to be able to remove and use that part from HMI. I would say that that hasn't that that requirement still exists today, even for these components. So that serviceability um, and the lighter you can make these, the easier it is to address that without having to look at um, secondary uh, equipment and um, you know, specialized uh, fixtures and jigging. By and large, however, um, there's still a debate, and just to be very open about that, whether a battery enclosure should be serviceable um, by everyone because of the, the, the potential danger that exists with the, um, with the high voltages uh, present in the battery pack. And so there's, there might be a need to actually you know, restrict some of the serviceability to specialized um, uh, workforces and therefore, there may not be the, the sort of um, carte blanche needs to be serviceable by everyone um, type requirement. But uh, there is a lot of um, there is a lot of proposed regulation on that. Right. Thank you. Uh, another question on this slide is how do you solve the EMI EMC issue or regulation? Uh, in a polymer composite, there are a number of ways to do that through um, uh, semiconductive uh, fillers. Um, and that can that can be integrated directly into the, the matrix material. Um, there's also ways to do that, and again, it depends on the design, uh, to have localized uh, EMI protection around critical components. So, you know, you might think some battery packs might require, a car, you know, 100% EMI protection at a very high level. You know, that's where you're looking at, you know, actually adding, um, uh, you know, electrically conductive fillers into the polymer for battery enclosures that have a localized requirement, um, inserts and uh, 
uh, and overmold with, um, with, with multi-polymer solutions can provide some of that uh, as two possible ways of doing that. There's many ways of doing that. All right, thank you. All right. Now diving into some of the, the Hexion specific side of things, I wanted to look at some specific material solutions uh, for uh, enclosures and we'll divide them up based around their process technology because the, uh, the requirements from both the processing side um, impart some need to have a specific um, material requirement such as viscosity or, or other uh, handling need for the polymer system. So the two major processes that we'll discuss today are sort of the sheet molding compound uh, process and the uh, RTM, so that's resin transfer molding or liquid compression molding process. Um, so the sheet molding compound has sort of the higher viscosity uh, thicker polymer that can that's you know relatively lower fill on glass level typically uh, resin transfer molding liquid compression molding are more for continuous fiber formats where you have a strong structural requirement but you need very low viscosity resin systems to wet out those fibers so those are sort of the two uh, two sides of the, the the coin here when it comes to processing uh, it's not that you can't say use a prepreg uh, or incorporate prepreg into either one of these um, but these are sort of the automotive centric technologies because they're um, relatively low cost, relatively high throughput and provide sort of the, the production capability for, for full, um, full vehicle production, you know, at a, a 500,000 parts per year type level. And we're already seeing this today. So uh, a quick primer on sheet molding compound for those that are, are not in the know. Um, you see a diagram on the left here you're taking a resin paste that is blended with all of the elements to cure that resin, um, to add in whatever secondary uh, material requirements you have, such as um, fillers or um, conductive elements. You might add in colorants or other such uh, low profile additives if you want a non-shrink system for class A. That gets filmed onto a carrier film and you would add a chopped fiber in the middle of that film to be able to uh, act as the reinforcement squish that chopped fiber into the resin paste so that it becomes a homogenous um, discontinuous fiber composite and then you have sheets of relatively isotropic material that material gets weighed and molded to a variety of complex geometric shapes why is this a great technology because it's already well established in industry because a lot of people know how to design both the tooling and all of the value chain to handle this so it's very easy to deploy uh, type of technology and it's already being used today to make battery enclosures. So it, it checks all the boxes. What would Hexion provide? We have been working on a phenolic resin system that is, uh, does not require additives. So it's inherently fire resistant. It doesn't have any uh, dangerous monomers and is low in formaldehyde. So not only is it safe to handle at the, the compound level, it's safe to mold. Uh, and this resin system is, um, is designed specifically to pass all of those really tough fire uh, smoke and toxicity tests that we just um, spoke about while providing the mechanical performance necessary for these, these battery enclosures. Um, this system has uh, taken you know, several years to bring to market and I would say you know, it's already being deployed in certain markets, um, China being the notably first adopter and very quick to move there where you know, US and, and Europe are moving, uh, moving to catch up. And we have, um, we have some early adopters in, in all of those markets. So while we can't point to specific uh, applications yet, because this is what we would say sort of a best in class uh, new material system, um, we can talk an awful lot about what it can do. And, uh, and even going so far as to show you real world test conditions for, for the material. Uh, but once this material is is compounded and is turned into a, a molded part. An example of which you see here. So this is a, um, a GM uh, Chevy Volt um, Series One battery cover. Uh, it's a legacy cover, but it shows sort of the typical geometry and it shows the complexity of molded part. Um, something that you would uh, generally see as realized in SMC very well because of the, the deep draw. So it's, it's designed to sit around that material format. We use it because it shows off sort of the real world design and we can do a lot of testing on it while acting as a surrogate. It's not actually a part in production today. Uh, I won't read off all the bullets here in just a moment, Shashank, I know you have a question. Um, yeah. But, but this, type of, uh, this type of material is, is designed to sort of produce a, um, 
a lightweight. So compared to a, an aluminum design, it would be a lighter weight and um, a cost-effective solution meeting all of those requirements uh, from a second ago. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions from the audience is, what is the typical cycle time to produce some of the parts you showed, like especially the top cover for the battery pack and uh, uh, this, this cover that you're showing on your screen right now? And uh, can we introduce a recycled stream uh, in, the pro uh, in the manufacturing for these products? Okay, those are very different questions. So what's the typical total cycle time? Um, well, I produced the part on screen in about three minute cycle time. So a two, two and a half minute cure time um, with about 30 to 45 seconds of, of charge loading and part unloading. And that was in sort of a laboratory sense uh, in a fully automated um, scenario, you would realize a, a similar, if not better, uh, cycle time for a part of this size. So this is a roughly 1.2 meter long by about 0.4 meter wide um, part, just to give you a sort of a footprint, weighs about seven kilograms. In, in Imperial, that would be four feet by a foot and a bit by another foot and a bit, and, and weighs about um, about 15 to 16 pounds. So it's not a very large part. Um, there are much larger parts on the market today for even larger sort of skateboard style um, uh, parts, and those those parts typically weigh about 50 pounds, if you will. Um, you know, two meters by one meter is a good sort of design size for some of the larger battery enclosure systems today. Can you realize uh, recycled material in this? Um, as filler, I don't see why not. I think it would depend on the type of filler, whether or not you would want to add it from the FR perspective or from a toxicity perspective. In terms of uh, utilizing recycled materials for flexibilizers or for colorants or pigments, again, a lot of options here. SMC is a very um, open design uh, material. You can add in a lot of different elements into the, the paste, the resin paste, or into the reinforcement phase uh, quite successfully, and, and that's done today. So something like this resin system, and, and just to keep this very clear, Hexion does not make the actual compound itself. We make the, uh, the resin, and compounders and molders would turn that resin into um, the semi-finished good, the sheet molded compound, and then into the final molded part. And we designed the resin to be very flexible that a compounder could create a family of solutions from this resin and use them in a variety of, of application areas. So where there's very strict requirements, you might have um, just a neat resin system and where you have, a, a say, lower mechanical or lower uh, fire performance requirements, you could add in a number of fillers or a number of, um, of recycled elements there. So just sort of quick follow-up question on that. Uh, how can these SMC compounds be recycled, aren't they thermosets? Aren't they thermosets? Absolutely. And they meet all of the European REACH directives for recyclability. Um, that is a whole separate topic, but just by and large, that the, the answers to that, you can regrind and add as filler uh, back to other uh, material systems. Um, it's commonly done in concrete as a filler uh, for concrete and for asphalt but you can also realize energy recovery at very high temperature in refractories. Um, you can, you can uh, I mean, they, they are still polymers, they will still burn, they just don't burn easily or well. All right, thank you. Uh, and to show that off, I'm oh, sorry, um, maybe, maybe to whet everyone's appetite and what these can do, I have a short video to show on the bonfire and then we'll actually show a fairly new video on some of the thermal runaway. So let me launch into this and then we'll allow another round of questions. Is this playing? It is not. One second. So we've shown this video a couple of times. Hopefully it's not too, um, too old hat.
All right. Uh, uh, questions, uh, Shawshank, that I asked you to pause on? Uh, no, I think we can continue, but I, I have a quick curiosity here. So uh, the flame temperatures in, in the video you showed reached 700 degrees or higher? Right. So the, um, there's always a question on temperature. 700 Celsius is the average temperature the surface of the uh, enclosure faces. Uh, most octane fuels burn at around 900 to 950 Celsius. Uh, but given the test requirements being um, you know, a half meter away from the surface of the enclosure, uh, the actual surface temperatures are around 700 Celsius on average. Okay. And the interior temperature, just for, um, for reference, on a, a two and a half millimeter thick um, phenolic, you know, glass fiber reinforced phenolic, the interior temperatures don't climb much above 120 Celsius. So there's a, there's a really good thermal resistance. There's really good uh, fire resistance there uh, on these materials. And even in the course of that testing, um, you see a couple of swatches pulled from that, that exact test. Uh, we still retain a lot of performance there, even after that, that high temperature uh, exposure. So we, when we ran those tests just for, for fun and for, uh, for sort of your own interest, we did not restrict the fire. We wanted to sort of see the worst case, and that was a, a two-minute test um, at a full exposure without having any restriction in the middle of that. The newer test, of course, is, um, uh, is a thermal runaway test. And, uh, and just so that everyone's aware, I have included links to the YouTube videos of this in the presentation deck so that you can see them afterward. The videos are quite large and it's hard to, hard to send those out. So if you're getting the slides afterward, we have all of the links there that you can watch these. Uh, this test is now conducted at 1400 Celsius. Um, I'm sure there's some questions on how we calibrate to that. I would happy to happily answer those offline. Um, but uh, I thought I would just show this video because it's, it's again a really interesting corollary to what you just saw being the more restrictive test. awful lot of information all at once. But uh, 
Uh, I've landed on sort of a materials page. And before I talk to this, um, just a couple of comments from some of the, the testing you just saw there, where you know the, the temperature of performance here is starting to become very interesting. And at high temperature, the phenolic resin, I mean, we've burned it clean out to 20 minutes without burning a hole through it. Um, it reaches a steady state, which is really, really interesting. So not only can it act as a, um, as a protector for the enclosure itself, but as thermal barriers inside the battery pack, depending upon the design, to prevent you know, cascade failure uh, of a battery enclosure. So the typical sort of performance, you could have 1400 Celsius on one side of a three millimeter panel uh, and, and you know, 300 Celsius or less on the other side of that same panel just to give you a sense of its, its resistance and its withstanding and, and have it do that for you know, 20 minutes continuous. Um, what's really interesting is without the filler in it that typically uh, comes with other you know, commercial fire retardant materials, typically they're ATH filled. Uh, ATH is aluminum uh, trihydride, which is a, a very common, very cheap um, fire performance additive to uh, polyester or vinyl ester materials. Um, that gets you a minimum level of performance, but cannot achieve some of these higher temperature um, and longer duration testing uh, performance requirements. They also end up um, really impacting negatively the mechanical strength of those materials. So real world performance, the panels you just saw burned, we have the, the panel highlighted in the first column for the phenolic SMC. A couple of examples in the middle there with, um, with a prepreg variant uh, for the same material for continuous fiber loading. Two commercial ATH filled polymers that are in use today for you know, phenolic or fire retardant, fire retardant applications that don't have quite as strict a requirement or have secondary performance um, uh, added. So either another, another FR type uh, coating or blend, or they have um, you know, very expensive uh, insulation or fire blankets inside the enclosure to be able to accomplish those, um, those performance metrics. Uh, and then sort of a cast aluminum that, um, again, from a production vehicle, we just uh, we purchased an off-the-shelf uh, cast aluminum part and, and tore it apart to, uh, to test it in some of these, um, uh, these, these high-temperature tests. The, the phenolic SMC certainly has very high tensile strength. The, the modulus is, is better than some of the commercial ATH materials, um, not quite the same caliber as a, as a metal, of course. But because of its moldability, you can mold in ribs and geometry that is not possible with, uh, with a casting or becomes very expensive if you're having to, um, to do weldments inside of an aluminum uh, enclosure. Uh, and so a typical design in conversion using this would allow for quite a bit of weight savings, um, which also means that you're able to see a, a, an increased value there of the material. Um, a last part of this, and I'll just sort of do a side by side here. We haven't turned this into a high production value video yet, uh, but there's a second protocol that exists as part of that high temperature requirement. Uh, and that inc incorporates both high temperature uh, exposure and also a mechanical loading, so a sandblast element. Uh, this type of a test is designed to fail every material that comes in contact with. Um, so I'll just put this on screen while I continue talking to it. And so it's, a, it's sort of a, a high temperature, um, low temperature, and in between you have a sandblast and you're counting the number of these cycles of uh, high temperature, low temperature um, sandblast type uh, exposures before failure. Let me just see if you can go to the last keyframe there. Um, and, uh, and the minimum requirement, of course, is five minutes of test, which is uh, at least five cycles. Um, you know, that can be achieved with a, about a three millimeter thick phenolic panel. And none of the other materials that are sort of on the market today can, can achieve those. Um, and we, again, took these from sort of standard designs um, uh, that are already available. So pulled them right from commercial, commercial materials. Uh, this is uh, the other part of that story where um, it's not simply, hey, let's meet one requirement. We want to meet the, the fire requirement or we want to meet the mechanical requirement of a battery enclosure. Meeting all of those requirements simultaneously is sort of the best design because then you're not having to invest in uh, extra assembly steps or secondary materials. Um, purchasing, you know, secondary fire protection can be very expensive to try to outfit a battery enclosure with these blankets or thermal wraps um, or, or spray on coatings that, that they do exist, but they're just um, they're prohibitively uh, expensive for automotive application. And the phenolic SMC is a material that sort of does the job uh, really well in, in all of these areas um, all at once. So I'll pause there if there's any questions on that before yeah, taking Ian, the last uh, few minutes of our of our talk for the RTM LCM side of things. 
let's let's finish the presentation because we have a lot of questions to cover and we got 10 minutes so sure so um with that said i'll leave the uh the slides for uh, resin transfer molding and liquid compression molding as homework um, um uh, let me just land on this sort of uh, uh keyframe slide here where uh, you know what would we what would we say we would say there's a number of solutions out there and we haven't gone into the rtm side of things um but i'm glad you got to see all the nifty videos and and fun um uh, application for the phenolic smc so different materials for different purposes where we would see these materials best positioned rtm lcm for continuous fiber composites for battery trays um, uh, smc for the covers and, and in fact, this is often where we're seeing a lot of the, the current uh, design interest to really improve and, and optimize um, these large sort of monolithic covers um, for, uh, for next-gen battery enclosures. So I'll stop there and, and open it up to questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ian. Let me turn my video on. Okay, so um, Great presentation, and we have some great questions from the audience, some of which I kept asking, but we have a lot of them. So let's uh, let's get to them one by one. So in the previous webinar, Constellium had had a slide which showed that EVs and uh, material the materials used for battery enclosures in EVs. Very few vehicles today use polymer composites for battery enclosures. Um, I guess the ob most obvious reason is cost. Do you see this trend changing in the future or com is composite only for premium vehicles? Uh, it's a really good question. I appreciate that. Uh, I think the, um, uh, the information from the Constellium presentation was a bit selective. I was really surprised to not see any of the many <laughs> polymer composite uh, battery enclosures that are on the market. Um, they've actually been on the market for a very long time, ever since the GM uh, Volt 1 vehicle, which was again a, an SMC ATH filled um, um, composite material, uh, all the way through to battery enclosures today. So you see um, uh, enclosures uh, around the globe that are still sort of a mixed material solution or um, uh, I would say there's a, a good mix, uh, about a 50-50 mix of aluminum and, and polymer composite materials on the market today. Uh, really, the, um, the thing that's driving a lot more direction towards the polymers is that fire requirement. So as that has come into play in China first and followed by, by Europe, um, the battery enclosures that are being designed are moving away from materials that are either very expensive to deploy, so things that require multiple assembly steps or very expensive um, wraps inside the, uh, the enclosure uh, and looking at sort of a more holistic um, material solution. Ian, I know you have a slide on a mixed material design with aluminum frame. Can we go to that? Because there's a question. Yeah. Yeah. One. So again, this is, um, this is done up very graphically because we can't show off the particular customer design behind this, but um, this would be sort of what would the size be of something like this? You know, maybe two meters long by a meter wide, designed for a, a moderate duty uh, vehicle in the United States. Uh, a moderate duty vehicle being sort of an SUV or or, or, or light duty truck, uh, where you have a sizable battery uh, pack associated with that vehicle, and to move away from the multi-part uh, assemblies and, and sort of the more expensive uh, solution, looking at sort of a, a, a simplified solution. The goal of this exercise was to look at what would be sort of the most efficient um, uh, design. And it's not a single material here. You'll notice it's sort of a multi-material uh, hybrid design that ended up being efficient for that particular approach. But I think that the lesson that learned is applicable across the industry. You know, use the right material where it matters. Um, a high FR performing material for the cover for passenger protection, you know, a, a heavily structural material um, for the tray. Uh, and some crash elements, um, uh, structural elements in the middle of it. it. It seems to be the direction a lot of the industry is going. So what kind of joining technologies do you use for a design like this? Uh, they're as varied as you can imagine. Um, typically, they are based around what the OEM is already very comfortable with. Uh, so if they're already comfortable with, um, with, with, with welding or riveting, um, you would use that joining technology. If, you're, if they're certainly familiar with some of the resin Joining technologies, that's a, a possibility. Um, mostly these types of designs have to be uh, at least somewhat partable so you can service them, which means there's typically um, a very common bolted uh, either cover or tray as part of the rest of the frame that's built into the skateboard. Right. 
So one, one more trend that we discussed in the last webinar was the box, the battery enclosure becoming part of the structure. And the, the, the question here is that, let me get that. Yeah, uh, I see the battery here is under the rear seat. So not a structural part or battery enclosures made of polymers that are only suitable for plug-in hybrids or non-structural batteries because of crash resistance. So do you, do you see uh, polymer composite battery enclosures becoming part of the structure uh, if that's a trend that, that follows in the future? Yes, but I think that's a lot further in the future than um, than people would imagine, or at least that I would uh, I would conceive. There, there's not a lot of design on the market where you're looking at replacing um, uh, holistically the body in white with uh, with a complete polymer composite. There are certainly vehicles on the market that do that today, and are already looking at FR based solutions for uh, for those elements or the elements around the battery. In terms of the, the more uh, approachable method for a lot of OEMs, where they are relatively metal intense in the body in white, the more approachable um, uh, design steps would be to, you know, replace things like the firewall or replace um, a portion of the cover or tray, uh, and turning that into a polymer composite, and slowly over time getting used to adapting these um, these, these structural materials for uh, for the body in white. Um, it goes without saying, but maybe it's worthwhile to mention it. Uh, if you can pass a high temperature fire test, you can pass an e-coat cycle. Um, and so, you know, a, a material that can that can withstand the battery enclosure requirements uh, necessarily means that you can pass some of the um, the, the painting steps. Uh, and actually, things like the phenolic, um, you know, it, it works very well with uh, with e-coat cycle or with um, you know powder-based coatings that typical polymers, you know, low temperature polymers can't withstand. Mm -hmm. uh what do you know about Japan's regulation in regards to fire and thermal standards like was described for China? Well, I don't, I couldn't quote it from memory. Um, certainly we've looked at it and we would say that between Japan and China, um, they both have their strengths and weaknesses, uh, certainly in terms of, of um, strictness. We point to the China one most often because the, the, the duration of the fire test um, tends to drive a lot of the rest of the design. Okay, there, there are two or three questions on what, what would be the upfront tooling cost? Ah, good question. So uh, that's not something that, that we as Hexion would, would typically um, dis put on display, but uh, for something like a phenolic SMC, it's an SMC tool that would work you know, for a million parts. Um, yes, the, the tools can be between a half million and a million dollars for a match metal tool set, depending upon the size and complexity. Um, but it's one tool set for the program. All right, maybe we can have one more. Is this battery box still relevant for solid state batteries? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, while not an automotive, um, application, we have some interest, I'd say strong interest even from, from aerospace where there are in a greater use of solid state batteries in, in portions of aerospace um, without going into detail there. And uh, there are multiple strategies to deal with that, but one of them is to isolate the batteries themselves into smaller units so that there's no monolithic battery pack, but at several smaller discrete battery packs. Uh, and there where you don't have maybe a big an issue of cascade failure, you still have the issue of high temperature failure. Uh, and so a, a phenolic um, a cover enclosure uh, is, uh, is readily um, uh, realizable, if you will. It's, it's certainly mm -hmm. a key target for some of those areas. Phenolic uh, resins are already a, a longstanding uh, approved material for aerospace. Um, it's, it's relatively new to automotive um, uh, applications. All right, maybe we can take one more. Uh, what would you recommend for manufacturing and fastening the mold? In my understanding that SMC materials can be somewhat difficult to paint, seal, and bond to. Okay, joining and, and painting and sealing are, are, are sort of three different, different problems. Um, sealing should really be a problem of your tool and flatness criteria. So I would say that's more of a geometric constraint Painting, um, again, there's uh, depend on whether you mean e-coat or you mean a secondary paint process. 
but most thermo sets are relatively easy to paint uh, and straightforward to paint. We have a number of examples on the market today that are that go through um, a class A cycle or sorry, like an e-coat type cycle. Um, and with the phenolic materials being even higher temperature resistant, um, certainly we can have an offline conversation about the, the simplicity it is with, with coating those. Uh, on joining, again, the technologies are more based around what the OEMs are familiar with and comfortable with today. Um, there are designs on the market where you have metal overmold inserts that you can directly weld to. Uh, and because the phenolic is a corrosion-free material, um, there's no issue with mismatch or with, um, uh, with you know, galvanic corrosion. The, um, some of the questions that were faced in the Constellium presentation, like um, uh, you know, thermal mismatch and, and things like um, um, coefficient of thermal expansion, it matches fairly close to aluminum. Um, and can be designed with the glass reinforcement and with other elements to minimize or expand that um, uh, that thermal contraction behavior so that you can match the surrounding structure, at least until such a time as the, the superstructure becomes a completely polymer composite design. All right. Um, so we are at two o'clock. Uh, so we have to end this webinar, but we will um, send the remaining questions to Ian. And even if you, if you can please answer them so that we can send them to the audience, that would be great. Uh, and thank you so much for the great presentation. And thank you everybody for attending. The recording of this webinar uh, will be available on the CAR website. And the next webinar on battery enclosures for steel design is next Thursday. So uh, look out for that. Thank you. Thank you very much.